Uh, good evening, everyone. My name is Mark, and on behalf of Book Soup, I'd like to thank everyone for joining us for a virtual event with Damien Eccles and Lori Davis, presenting their new book, Ritual. For regular updates on upcoming events, please feel free to subscribe to our email newsletter. The, uh, this evening's virtual event will end with a Q&A. To submit a question, please use the Ask a Question button at the bottom of the screen. If you see a question on the list that you'd like for our speakers to answer, please click the like button. We'll try to answer as many questions as time will allow. Also consider supporting our bookstore and the author's work by purchasing a copy of today's featured book, Ritual. Just click on the green purchase button directly below the viewer screen. The link will redirect you to our website where you can continue your checkout process uninterrupted. Now, a few words about our featured guest. Damien Eccles is the author of High Magic, Angels and Archangels, in the New York Times bestseller, Life After Death. His wife, Lori Davis, is a film producer and former landscape architect. The story of their courtship by mail during Damien's unjust imprisonment in the West Memphis Three case is profiled in the 2019 book, Savage Appetites, and is the topic of their co-authored book, Yours for Eternity. Damien, Lori, and their cats live in the Southern US. For more, visit DamienEccles.com. Without further ado, I'm going to turn the camera over to Damien and Lori. Uh, they're going to do a little intro on the book, and then we're going to jump right into questions. So I'll be back shortly. Thank you, Mark. Thank you so much. Hi, everybody. Hey, guys. I see a <laughs> lot of my people from Patreon on here already. So thank you all for showing up here tonight. Yes, absolutely. We appreciate y'all being with us. We actually realized um during the pandemic that we kind of liked doing things like this even better than you know the in-person things part of the reason being because uh you can join us from pretty much anywhere in the world and you don't have to get on a plane or get hmm. in a car yeah uh so what what we're going to do tonight for the most part is answer your questions you know we're here to talk about whatever y'all want to talk you know, we already know all of our own stories and, and, you know, what we're thinking you may find interesting may have, you may not, you may have something else entirely in mind you want to talk about. Uh, but we started, when did we start writing Ritual? Goodness, it's been a couple of years. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And it, it was, it came to us at, just as an idea and, and we talk about it in the introduction to the book, um, just healing from complex trauma. And I heard something, a, a, a phrase today that I've never heard before. Um, and it was called a trauma bond. And that's exactly what we were living through for a long time was this trauma bond. It's like we were both sort of gripped by trauma. And then when that happens, it's like you, you can't get out of it. It li literally is a bond that holds you. And so we started doing ritual to heal ourselves. And we were doing it literally separate from each other. So that's why this book came about the way that it did with my voice and Damien's voice. And these are the rituals that we used to heal ourselves. And also just for other, you'll see there, there's all kinds of rituals in this book. You'll, if you've gotten it already, or if you plan on getting it, one of the things you'll see is that it kind of um, like, we didn't just write it as one whole cohesive book. It's almost like two books in one cover. Yeah. Uh, the, the chapters kind of switch back and forth. Some were written entirely by me, some were written entirely by Lori, and it kind of alternates back and forth between our voices. One of the things we were wanting to do with this, you know, a, a lot of y'all that have uh, been with us for, um, you know, retreats and workshops at Joshua Tree, or those of you that are with me on Patreon or, or have done classes in some way, you know that, for the most part, what I've been focusing on for the past couple of years or so is always what in magic we call the great work, you know, the process of awakening, bringing about this change in consciousness. Um, but th there's another aspect of it, and it's the aspect of being able to shape reality, being able to create the life that you want to create. Uh, change the things you want to change, whether they're internal in yourself or external in the world around you. And a lot of people kind of uh, downplay that or, or don't pay much attention to it, you know, just because 
it doesn't seem as lofty philosophically, spiritually as, as something like, you know, going through the awakening process or discovering your true nature, or um, finding the God within, whatever you want to call it. But it's still important. You know, being able to, to shape your life and change things around you is what keeps you from feeling powerless. You know, one of the things you see going on uh, in the world today is people feel like they're, there's stuff going on that they are completely and absolutely powerless to change in any way or it's beyond their control. Whenever you learn to do this stuff and incorporate it into your everyday life, you lose that feeling. You don't feel like there's nothing you can do about anything anymore. You realize that you can exert some sort of influence on reality. And when you, what we wanted to do in this book is show little but really effective ways of doing that. You know, things like some of the ones that I put in there, for example, were shielding yourself, you know, like using energy to shield yourself from being bombarded and saturated by all the outside energy being directed at us all the time. Uh, Lori put some in there about um, like grounding, like, like releasing the energy that you do accumulate and that you may not even realize you're, you're taking on. Uh, as well as just, you know, pretty much anything you can imagine, even though some people, you know, it's it's a thing that a lot of people are uncomfortable talking about now, like to use magic for, for money purposes, for like prosperity, but you absolutely can. And there's nothing wrong with it whatsoever. So there's little bits of, you know, little stories in there about um, how we've done that, you know, changed our lives in pretty much every way, whether it's your physical life, your mental life, your work life, whatever it is, we wanted to focus on ways that you can do that in everyday life in very simple but effective ways. So it's practical mm -hmm. magic. Right. And it's all about really, truly, to, to live on earth and have an abundant, happy, joyful life. That's what it's all about. And also, like Damien was saying, you know, of course, doing the work, but you know, having money or having health and having peace, joy, those things are all things we should be experiencing. And that's what this book is about, is finding that. Mm -hmm. So, Mark, if you want to open it up for questions, we'd be happy to take some. Awesome. So mm -hmm. our most voted question is from Lori Hensley. She asks, I love both of you guys. Congratulations about the new book. Both of you are passionate about justice, art, and magic. But now, what are you passionate about? What is the future now? Thank you. That's interesting, Lori. <laughs> I'm going to start. Uh, transition. Um, and that's exciting. And, and we didn't even really realize we were in a transition. Uh, we left New York City in, in July um, and moved to the South. And... Um, it's, it was a big change for us because we've been in New York for a long time. It's the only place Damien knows as a home since he's been out of prison. But we're just kind of seeing where life's going to take us right now. And we have never had that freedom. Mm -hmm. It's And it's exhilarating and it's a little bit overwhelming. Uh, but we're taking on big projects and we're um, trapped. Damien's learning to drive, which we never <laughs> thought that would be possible. Um, we always thought his eyesight would, you know, or just who, who knows, we'd never get out of New York and he'd never learn how to drive, but it's kind of interesting being in a place where you, you don't really know what the future holds yet. You just keep moving forward with different projects and it's kind of fun. I think for me right now, like the whole time we were writing ritual, I was kind of living in a state where I was turned completely internal, you know? Pretty much the vast majority of my time for a long period of time was dedicated to like very intense hours a day, ritual work, study, yeah. you know, almost to the point of living like a, a monk or a priest or something for a, a chunk of at least a couple of years. And then I feel kind of like I'm swinging back to the other end of that arc 
now, like the, the reverse, and, I, and I'm focused more externally. So I'm really liking things like learning how to drive. Mm -hmm. You know, th th it's something I never, th I thought it would be beyond my ability to do. I thought I would probably die without ever having done that. And now that I've started to do it, I absolutely love it. And part of the reason is because one of the things that lets you learn and experience is like how different every place in this country is. You know, we go to all these different states and each one kind of has things about it, not even kind of, they do. They have things about it that's unique unto them. You know, whether it's the culture or the landscape or the architecture, whatever it is, it's like every place is a little bit different. And what I'm enjoying is kind of feeling and immersing ourselves into all these different places to, to feel the difference in all of them. Yeah. But, you know, I think that in itself is kind of an education process, even beyond things like reading books or watching movies or something like that. It's a kind of direct firsthand experience that's, that's changing you because you realize, and I'll shut up, I swear, in just a second, but you realize that, for every place that you go that, that's different, you're going to be a different person when you're there because we're all impacted by the energy around us in one way or another. So it's kind of interesting to see the changes that take place in you whenever you're going through changes in geographical location. And, and I will say that this is a, it's a huge change for us because the first 10 years that when Damien, you know, got out, it literally was about dealing with trauma, trying to learn, he was trying to learn how to live in the world. It took a long, we had no idea how long that process was going to take. So this really is a whole new beginning for us because just to travel and have fun and not have to be worried about just the toll it's going to take or how long, you know, just what can, you know, just how, how much of, pressure it's going to be on him to trap. So anyway, it's, it's a good time. It's a fun time. So thank you, Lori, for that question. Great. Uh, just a reminder to everyone that you can upvote questions. Uh, so the questions that you like the most can appear at the top. Our next one comes from Rohelia. Hello, Damien and Lori. Thank you both for all you do. What do we have to look forward to with the Magnum Opus School in New Orleans? Mm -hmm. No, um, we don't really have any updates right now yeah. just because nothing's happening. We've had so much other stuff going on that it's kind of been on the back burner. Uh, you know, for example, one of the things we're doing right now is getting ready for this hearing in Arkansas at the end of June. Uh, this will be the biggest opportunity that we've had in the past 30 years of finally completely and absolutely clearing my name mm. this DNA testing. Yeah. Uh, so that's one of the main priorities we've been focusing on. Another one is just get, trying to get get our feet under us. And, yeah. And I don't think we realized how overwhelming moving across country yeah. into a new city where you've never lived and you don't really understand the culture and how things work. You don't know anyone. And then we had Ida, the hurricane. Anyway, it was a whole, it's a whole experience. Um, and so while we still definitely have plans, on setting up the school. I think we just need to learn how to live out here a little bit before mm -hmm. we move into that because we're very serious about it um, and doing it in the right way. Uh, and whether we have it a, a brick and mortar or we set it up online, we're still talking about that and planning it. So it's still in the works, but or it'll even, just be a little bit later. Yeah, another thing we've been thinking is maybe it won't even be in one place. Right. Maybe what we want to do kind of move around and do retreats yeah mm -hmm. do it at in different, different places mm -hmm. so yeah we're still planning talking about it and hopefully within the next year we can start finalizing some things. and speaking of the traveling around and doing the retreats and stuff we'll keep y'all posted but it's looking like the next one for you know we've done a couple the past few years in joshua tree and it's a place we really really love and are having and people come there. So we're talking about uh, going back and doing another retreat there with them at the end of this year, maybe around September. In September. So we'll and focus on ritual. Yeah. yeah. We'll keep y'all posted on the dates for that so that if you want to come back to this.
this one. You'll be able to join us there too. Great. And our next question, by the way, uh, Damien and Lori, do you mind if I minimize my video screen? I know uh, yeah. Yeah. partially obscured, obscuring Lori's face. <laughs> <laughs> That's all right. <laughs> so Kel Samira asks, is there anything new that's been inspiring your daily practice? And if so, uh, what? Wow. For me, yeah. I mean, I've, I've for ever since we moved here, you know, it's like whenever you do these practices for a long period of time in the same space, you kind of build the energy up in there. And that kind of, you know, adds to habit and routine and keeps you focused and, and moving forward. Whenever you move, that kind of gets disrupted. And honestly, it felt like like it kind of warped my practice for a little while. Like I wasn't putting as much energy and, and attention into it and instead was focusing on, you know, just trying to get our life together out here. So but I feel like lately, even in just like the past few weeks, I've really started to kind of get my feet under me and, and start focusing, you know, taking my attention off of the outward world again and kind of focusing more on the practices. And what I've, you know, this, the thing that I've always loved uh, in one form or another has always been doing angel work, you know, like the pentagram and hexagram rituals where you're using uh, angelic energies. Uh, what I'm trying to build up to right now, you know, some of these practices, by the time you're adding all these different astrological angels and all this kind of stuff, you're talking about, you know, like sometimes up to three hours to, to go through the entire ritual one time. So you build up to that. But one of the things I think that I'm really kind of excited about right now is building up to the, the kind of final stage in that process is, is when you're invoking, you know, there's like 360 degrees in the Zodiac and there is an angel that kind of embodies the energy of each of the 360 degrees of the Zodiac and you start invoking those around you. So that's what I'm, I'm building up to right now. I think my the, what's inspiring me more than anything right now is just doing it's basically doing some housework um there's a after coming um out of sort of healing our relationship and moving forward i started to realize i had a lot of work to do in other realms and so it's been very quiet sort of very personal work but you know just healing problems I had with my family or just looking at my behavior and figuring out what are things that I could work on? How can I, um, you know, is it just being more quiet? Is it listening or just things like that, that I realize I have this opportunity. We all do every day to work on myself. And that's what I want to do. I just, I want to become like very, as much as I can present, of course, but also just pay attention to the behaviors that really just aren't very good um, and maybe have held me back in the, in the past. That's a, that's a huge part of magic is, is the work we do on ourselves. Yeah. You know, a lot of times that's far more important than um, the work we do to change things in the outside world. All right. Uh, Troy Holder asks, uh, I'd like to devote more time to doing rituals, but find it hard to make time because of work. Have any ad advice? Just cram it in wherever you can. You know, even if, if you have a 30 minute lunch break or if you have a 15 minute bathroom break uh, and, and that ultimately those hardships, if you figure out ways to get through these times, if you can, you know, despite having to do everything that you're having to do if you can figure out uh you know be like have enough discipline to make yourself do it even when the conditions are not ideal you know like if you have to sneak off to the bathroom for a few minutes to do something it's those times it's it's when you put that level of commitment and discipline into this stuff that you're going to get the biggest results because what will end up happening when you do that is you're basically teaching yourself to adapt to any situation right. that no matter what situation you find yourself in you're able to still keep doing magic because that's the most important thing not reading the books or thinking about it but doing it but, you know 
one of the people that I used to talk to, the way he described it, he said, ideally, you want to get to a place where you can be dropped off butt naked in the middle of the jungle somewhere and immediately start doing these practices to help yourself in some way. It's having to find ways to adapt to the situation that you're in where you're going to have to cram stuff here and there. That's what's ultimately going to make you the better magician. Well, and also, as you'll find, and not just our book, but there's so many practices. There's practices you can do in the shower. There's practices you can do while you're falling asleep at night. Mm -hmm. There's practices you can do if you do, say, you're um, commuting in your car or on a train. There's so many things you can do in those little moments of time. And in that, you can ritualize your life so that literally your life becomes ritual. Mm -hmm. You wake up doing a ritual, you do a ritual while in the shower, while it, during breakfast. So there's so many opportunities to bring it into your life, like Damien was saying, in these little moments. Mm -hmm. This uh, question comes from Andrea L. Meadows. Hi, uh, Damien and Lori. Hello from Melbourne, Australia. I look forward to learning more about ritual and under your guidance, putting your ideas into practice. At current, the entire globe is under siege with military precision. Do you foresee this happening? How can we collectively rise above the evil forces at play? And do you believe we the people will triumph in this spiritual war? There's so much darkness yet to navigate. Will justice be served? Well, <laughs> I think, you know, I just, just kind of everything you're talking about, I think you kind of encapsulated it in that last sentence about, you know, will, will, how did you say it? Will justice prevail? Or, you know, it was something in that vein. Ultimately, you know, like the, 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 what I do and the practices of like astrotheurgy, high magic are very, very tied in to, um, you know, like very old Judaic and uh, Gnostic Christian concepts. So you do get a lot out of studying the Bible and knowing, you know, what it's actually saying behind or beyond the code that it's written. For example, we know there was never any such thing as talking snakes. Um, it symbolizes something. So you get a lot out of studying the Bible. And one thing that I've gotten out of it, and this isn't just something that I've read, this is something that I've seen take place over and over and over in my life, is that all things work together for the glory of God. It's, that's the way it's described in the Bible. You know, even things that are painful, even things that are horrendous, even things that that look detrimental to us. You know, there's times in my life when I've been going through some horrible things and I did not see any way that that could possibly even remotely be for my benefit in the slightest bit. It just felt like I was going through miserable, dark times. But it was when I would get later down the road and look back on it and be able to see it in hindsight, I would realize that no matter how dark it was or no matter you know how painful it was that I thought it was at the time I can still see ways that it benefited me in some way that it it contributed to some kind of growth and development in me that I didn't even know I was experiencing at the time I only realized it at so I see that it is 100% true that not only do all things come together for the glory of God, to serve the glory of God, but it's like all the things that we go through in our lives and all the things that the world is going through, it's ultimately a learning experience. Yeah. It's a process that even though things may seem dark right now, we will look back one day and see that something good came from it in some way, some kind of growth some kind of better, bigger understanding. Something came from it or will come from it that will benefit us in some way. And I think that's what it means by all things work together for the glory of God. And when you look at the world that way and you see the world that way, you realize that if that's true, if all things are contributing to our benefit in some way or another, 
which is kind of what I've seen in my own life. You know, looking back, I always say now that all the stuff on death row and prison, even though it was horrendous, I would not want to go through it all again, any of that stuff. I still see how it promoted me. Like it, it ultimately led to me being the person that I am now. And I learned amazing, miraculous things in some of the darkest times of my life. And I think that's the same thing that's going to happen in the world. It may not end up the way we think it should. It may not end up exactly the way we picture it in our heads. But ultimately, we will come out of this in a way that's going to lead to us becoming better than we were before. We're going through the alchemical process. The whole world is going through an alchemical process, and we're going to be refined and purified through it. But we also know it's got to be hard, and so we're thinking about you and we're praying for you. Yeah. That doesn't, yeah, it's like, that doesn't mean it's going to be easy. Yeah. But if you remember that, sometimes it gives you enough hope to let you yes. uh, hang on for another day. Right. And ultimately, that's all you have to do is make it through one more day. You don't have to make it through 10 years. Right? Right. All you have to do is focus on getting through right now. Great. Uh, Astarte Earthwise asks, uh, if you had to choose the best ritual for restoring health, what would you recommend and why? That's interesting because I would say the vacuum. Yeah, when we always call it the vacuum, what what she's talking about whenever she says that, it's where you're kind of establishing an, an energetic grounding cord to the earth and like releasing anything that's that's not beneficial to you, whether it's physically or emotionally or mentally, whatever it is, kind of letting it ground out of you. I think both of us have used that a lot. Yes. We got a lot mm-hmm. out of it. But for me also, the thing I think that is that's like always had remarkable results in my life is uh, the solar hexagram. Which, you know, when you're talking about solar energy, you're talking about like the, the, the sun is the life force of this world. It's what, you know, feeds chi, feeds energy uh, to, to all life forms here. So whenever you're doing that solar hexagram ritual, you're kind of saturating yourself with this life force. And usually just by doing that, by providing your energy system with an overabundance of energy, a lot of times it can heal whatever's wrong with the cell. So that's that, the solar hexagram ritual, and also the grounding. Yeah, and I think also with the vacuum, and if you don't know it, we describe it in the book, but you do the vacuum and you pull everything out and, and you recycle it in the center of the earth. But then once that's done, close everything up and then bring that, that gold light down mm-hmm. and fill yourself up with that healing light. Yeah. And then through all of that, you're breathing through the whole thing and breath is God and breath is health. So it's like, so you're, you're coming at it in so many different ways. Eric, uh, this next one is from Eric. In the beginning of ritual, you talk about God and how the religions use the same code. Do you go into further detail about this subject in another book? I've come to this and other conclusions about religion and reading you uh, has a similar view. Reading that you have a similar view helps me see I'm on the path I need to be on now. Well, I I think um, this... This book, Ritual, you know, we've been talking about it for a while now, and I think it's probably, Lori might want to do another one in this in this same, in this sort of vein, like as High Magic or Angels and Archangels or Ritual, where, you know, it's more like an instructional book, uh, giving you, you know, step-by-step practices. But for me, I feel like I've kind of exhausted what I want to say in, in that kind of format. So I don't see myself writing any more magic books of this kind, you know, like step-by-step textbook type things. Uh, But I'm Mm -hmm. currently working uh, with a bishop from the Church of Latter-day Saints, and we're working on a novel together. You know, it'll still be about magic, but it won't be an instructional manual. It'll be more in the vein of like, Alistair Crowley's Moonchild or, or some of the novels that Dion Fortune wrote where it's, you know, actual stories, 
but there's still like magic interwoven into it, whether it be history or, you know, the philosophy or uh, theory behind it, any of that stuff, but it's done in like a entertaining format, like a story. Right. And one of the things that we're doing is kind of weaving more of this stuff, like the, the biblical symbolism or, or iconography, kind of weaving that into the stories. You know, part of it, part of it for those of you who've been with us for a long time, like on Patreon or whatever, uh, or, or come to the things, you know, I've always talked about. Uh, my brain just went blank. What was it? Something about, the, oh, how art now is not what it's been, the way it's been looked at or what it's been used for throughout previous civilizations and cultures. How in the past, all the way up until the Renaissance, Art was always considered to be a vehicle uh, to pass along information. You know, they a lot of these civilizations and cultures knew a day would come when we didn't speak their language anymore or when we couldn't read their language anymore. But like the ancient Sumerians and the Egyptians, all the way up until the Renaissance, you know, they even incorporated elements of it into Christianity. They knew that even if you couldn't speak or read the language, if you could figure out how to decipher the iconography, you could still get to the truths behind these these images and myths. Um, so we're trying to take a lot of that sort of stuff and incorporate it into the story. Yeah, and while you, you know you brought up religion, um, I was raised in a you know very a fundamentalist um, Southern Baptist type religion, and while I um, I I've, I've moved away from that structured kind of teaching and community, I find that um, it did at least give me a foundation for understanding prayer and understanding um, the concept of God. But that those that I've, I've really like just gone so much further. And I think maybe that's what you're thinking too is yes. I mean, and also it's a solitary path, magic, as opposed to religion, which is much more, you know, congregation and community. And I like the freedom of having the solitary path. I mean, you can still have community and still talk to people about it. And, but it really is, you've got to do the work. Yeah. It's like, you know, Crowley said at one point, he said, I think, I fear that some people have gotten the idea that the great work is a tea party. And kind of what he was saying is that, that the great work is not a group activity. It's something that no one can do for you and no one can help you with. You know, other people may have to give you the information you need mm -hmm. to, to be able to do the techniques and stuff, but ultimately it's going to come down to you and whether you want to, to do it. And like, you know, some people enjoy the fellowship aspect of things like religion or yeah. what have you. Mm -hmm. And if that's something that you feed on, if that's something that, you know, motivates and inspires you and, and makes you keep your practice up, then that's great. Yeah. But for us, we were always, um, both of us, were more just about the work yeah. you know that's what always has the biggest impact on our lives is actually doing the work and you, nine times out of ten when you're doing the work you're doing it alone yeah. this next one's from sam lady on what extent do you believe that practicing magic with your significant other can affect your relationship mm -hmm. oh <laughs> I'll start. I think uh, tremendously so. You know, relationships are going to change over time. You're not, you know, if you've been with someone 10, 20, 30 years, the way you feel about them isn't always going to, or the way you feel together isn't always going to be the same as it is in the very beginning. You know, the nature of relationships is they have to grow and change or else they're going to die. And so, I mean, ultimately, if you continue to grow and the person you're with continues to grow, you're both eventually going to be different people than the ones you were whenever you met. Yeah. And magic is something that provides kind of an anchor and for both of you and a thread kind of attaching both of you uh, so that you're still always linked. You know, it's like your relationship becomes part of your practice 
and it becomes a huge chunk of, of what makes you grow. You know, it's just, we, we, we change throughout time. And my brain went like again, I forgot where I was going with that. Well, you know, I mean, just for us, just for instance, when I met Damien, I wasn't practicing magic. I had pretty much abandoned any kind of a spiritual practice. Um, and then slowly we, you know, we moved into sitting Zazen, um, studying Buddhism and practicing Buddhism. Mm -hmm. And then from there, Damien started teaching me magic while he was in prison. And then we used it, of course, with the help of, you know, thousands of people around the world, we use magic to, um, for his release. And then of course, everything crashed and we became these very um, damaged people and literally hit rock bottom at one point. And so we had to come back as new people. Mm -hmm. And through that, we did it all through, through magic. Um, and it's just like Damien saying, there's this, we don't practice, do the exact same practice, but we have a language that we can speak uh, when we yeah. need support or when we, you know, for anything, for things that we want. Our, the work that we have put into our relationship, I'm so grateful for it because to have someone, and I, and I know everyone doesn't want this, but to those who do want a long lasting relationship, like a partner for life, it really does give the a, a, an amazing foundation. Yeah. To, that's, for, to grow on. That's exactly what it is. Yeah. Yeah. Our next question comes from, let's see, David Blankenship. Having had the confining experience of practice in prison, how do you find different locations help or hurt your focus? Hmm. You know, for one thing, for me, I think being in one place and doing ritual work in the same space every single day that I possibly can that is a huge help to me no matter where it is you know whether it's in new york city or new orleans or in a hotel somewhere um it's harder when you're traveling because you're like in a different hotel room every day so you can't really build the energy up in one place the way you know but if you're in a house uh try to do it in the same room every day that's always a huge help just getting into the habit of doing that um but you know, there's all these different rules or, or, you know, not rules as in thou shalt and thou shalt not, but rules as in how, how the, how different levels of reality work. And I think those are always beneficial things to study for stuff like this. You know, for example, they say that uh, the higher you go up, like the more purified the energy is because most people are down here on the ground where we're creating all of this kind of psychic um, interference and influence and everything else all around us. So the higher you go up, the fewer people there are. So this is why, like in all those old stories, like in the Bible or in, in ancient Sumerian traditions, they would always talk about how they would build their altars and shrines in a high place. Uh, and there are all these rules about like to, in ancient Sumer, like to be considered a true king you had to meet certain criteria or do certain things. And one of those things was like viewing the land at the highest possible level, because that's what allows you to see further than anybody else down the road. So there were all these like connotations about high places and how they're more beneficial to doing ritual work, and doing energy work, because there's less uh, human interference. Um, so, you know, you can take things like that into consideration geographical, like actual geographical location, and, uh, trying to get to the highest spots you can in the land where you're at. Uh, I think also just to the best of your ability, kind of keeping your place clean, um, wherever you're doing magic at daily, keep it clean so that there's not a, because if there's a lot of physical clutter and disarray, then there's also going to be a lot of energetic clutter and disarray. So to the best of your ability, keep your, your space clean. I think that is very important as far as places go. Is it any others? Yeah, not really. 
This question's from Aaron. Other than magic type stuff, what do you guys like to do in your free time? We like to drive around and look at things and uh, we like to go to movies a lot. Yeah. Um, we've done that since Damien got out. I've always been like a, like just a crazy music fan, but I mean, movie fan. Um, we walk, we walk around a lot. Um, I really like biking. Yeah. Yeah. You know, something that has nothing to do with magic whatsoever, but I've loved ever since I was a child. It was just yeah. bike riding. And I used to do art for a living, and I kind of dropped out of it for a long time, drawing. Um, and so just starting to draw again and to realize how quickly you just get lost in doing that kind of creative work. So that's fun. Great. Uh, our next question is from Joe Bailey. What's your thoughts about tapping into different timelines to experience preferred realities? You know, that's, that's actually something that I did a lot of work with when I was in prison. One of the things I realized, you know, like when we're talking about like manifesting something in our lives, like changing something, making something different than what it is, we usually think that that's something that has to happen. It's something that has to shape, take place in the future. That it's a state will change from now into, you know, something else down the road. But, you know, if everything that we're learning now, not just what magic tells us, but also in the realm of like quantum physics, we know that the future is no more real than, than the past is. That if we can shape the future in some way through acts of will, then there's no reason that we also should not be able to do the same thing to the past. So usually when people are talking about, you know, the, the timeline stuff like that, they're, they're talking about the future. But one of the things for me that I found the most beneficial was doing ritual work aimed at healing traumas that I had been through in the past that had left like incredibly detrimental uh, scars on me psychically, you know, mentally and, and emotionally stuff I went through when I was in prison. So what I would start doing was doing energy work, invoking as much as I possibly could and then directing it towards myself while I was going through traumatic experiences in the past. And one of the things that I learned is that while it may not undo what you went through, you know, for example, one of the things that really kind of traumatized me was being beaten by guards in prison. So just using that as a concrete example, if I direct the energy back to myself while I am going through the beating, it doesn't make the physical damage that I received not have happened but what it does is kind of heals the emotional and mental trauma and changes that happen in you and in your psyche because of you going through that it changes that and allows you to let go of it emotionally and mentally and heal from that so while it may not completely change the physical reality or heal you physically i'm not saying it won't anything is possible but for me, what I've discovered more often than not is what it does is um, just heals me on, on other levels. So that the, the majority of any work that I do that involves time has always been more about the past versus shaping the future. Yeah, and you can also do the same work and go back and say you had a horrible argument with someone and that and you never could heal from it. You, you don't have to get in touch with the person or anything, but you can go back to that time yeah. and heal that situation. I've done that with a lot of, with a lot of situations or um, things that happened in my past. And I've actually felt a change when I did see the person and we may not even have like a relationship anymore, but we may see each other or have to talk to each other for some reason. And I've noted that there's a difference in the way that they feel about me and the way that I feel about them. Mm -hmm. And that's pretty amazing too, to be able to do that. Yeah, it is. 
That's beautiful. Uh, Amanda asks, what's a small piece of advice you would give to help people stay grounded in the moment without losing motivation? For me, I think it would be the thing that keeps you grounded in the moment. And it's, this is not something you're going to learn overnight. You're, this is something that actually takes a lot of practice is, you know, we think of doing magic like in our homes during the same time every day, you know, going through ritual work, even if we're doing magic for something, like say, for example, you know, just going back to what we were just talking about, me sending energy to myself in the past, we still think of doing it in our space during our daily rituals. And that stuff is great. That stuff is like of tremendous importance and value to have that daily practice of doing that stuff. But I think one of the things that also really helps is that that'll keep you grounded in the moment is training yourself over time to be able to remember to do energy work, to do magic while something is happening. You know, I think that is, is for, for whatever reason, uh, momentously more powerful. I found in my own practice that the times that I can remember in the moment, okay, don't just get angry at this or don't get scared about this or, uh, you know, don't spin out of control and feel like there's nothing you can do about this. If you can force yourself in that moment to remember, okay, stop right now and immediately start bringing the light down on something or, you know, whatever your preferred method is of, of directing energy to it. If you can train yourself to remember to do it in the moment not only does it usually you know it's like they say a stitch in time save nine not only does it benefit you in the long run uh, but it also trains you to stay grounded in the present moment because you have to be here in order to be doing magic now right mine is i, I came upon a very very simple technique um back when I literally just could not get out of bed because I was just so just devastated from everything. And sometimes, and I think all humans have moments when they feel scared for no reason. Like you're just suddenly like going around and suddenly you either feel out of control or you feel scared or you just don't feel grounded in your body. All I do, because we are all aspects of God, we are all God within. And so what I learned to do was just say, be still and know that I am God. And every time I did it, I would just be filled with peace in that moment. And then I was able to move on from it. <coughs> Our next question is from Artemis. How do you find the energy to balance ritual with times where mundane life gets demanding? Well, one, you know, going back to exactly like we were just talking about, it helps to balance it out if you can, once again, train yourself to be able to do magic on every single aspect of your life as you're doing it. You know, even if you're doing something like standing in the kitchen, washing the dishes, there's no reason that you can't be using energy work at the same time, you know, using pentagrams or hexagrams to in invoke energy over the water of the, you know, where the dishes are soaking in order to like imbue them with a particular energy so that when your family's eating off of them, they're also consuming the energy that you put into right. it. You know, if you can train yourself to use magic in every single aspect of your life like that, you know, like washing the dishes, then you're probably going to become better at this than, than the person who does manage to dedicate an hour a day of their lives to doing these rituals, you know, because you're going to be integrating it into your life more quickly and thoroughly than they will. So that, that's, that's the first thing I think is just um, making yourself more and more and more do it throughout the course of the day. We have a guest. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Uh, Genesis asks, how did you connect with your holy guardian angel? What signs did you receive? Um, I, for, you know, 
just you, there's a million different ways you can do it, but there's there's certain rules. Uh, also, in all of these practices, you know, you can go through the Abramelin work, but once again, there's still a lot of symbolism in there that you need kind of somebody to explain to you to, to get, you know, as much out of the work as you possibly can. But ultimately, it comes to just working your way up through this kind of celestial ladder uh, through ceremonial work, starting at the elements, moving up through the planets, then through the zodiacal energy and whenever you do that and whenever you just focus on that then everything else takes care of itself you won't have to necessarily do any of the uh, hga work in and of it you know like the abramelin ritual it just happens as a side effect of doing this work clay asks what is the best way to understand biblical symbolism I'm going to refer you to uh, a writer, Emmett Fox. Um, mm -hmm. He writes amazing books, Decoding the Bible, um, a whole book that's dedicated to the Lord's Prayer, a whole book that's dedicated to the Beatitudes. And then he writes, but anything by him, I think, is just absolutely amazing. And I look at the Bible in such a different way now after reading him. But... I think Damien has other sources too. Manly P. Hall, I think, is a really good place to start. Uh, he was a Freemason. He wrote a lot about the symbolism of Freemasonry, but he also did one. Um, I can't remember what the name of it was, but if you just like go on Amazon or go to a bookstore and look up, you know, Manly P. Hall, uh, you'll know it whenever you see the title. It's something about. Um, symbolism in the Bible, then he does really great work of explaining this stuff too. Um, Aaron asks, which one of the rune symbols on your fingers, Damien, means the most to you? Do you live the most by? To be exact, uh, honest, I can't even remember what they are anymore. I can't remember what they mean. Uh, I remember you know, it was during a time period when I was still like my fingers, the runes on my fingers, I had done like within days of getting out of prison. Uh, and I can just remember thinking, okay, I want to get things that are going to have energy that's going to be helpful or beneficial to me and surviving just day to day life out of, out of prison, out here in the world. So I remember uh, getting things that I thought were important, like symbols for friendship, uh, protection, prosperity, stuff like that. Um, but, you know, honestly, most of that stuff, I tend not to retain a lot of information that's not going to, uh, you know, serve me repeatedly in some way. So a lot of times I even forget, you know, stuff like that, like, like what each of them means anymore. So now when I look at them, I just remember, these are things that I wanted to have in my life in some way. Yeah. And they're still doing their job. Yes. Joanna Rebel asks, uh, I'm fascinated by the colliding of free will and yet a destined path unraveling, working in conjunction together. What are your thoughts on both those worlds colliding? That's a really, really hard Thing. I mean, that's a big topic you're talking about there. Yeah. Um, and and any, honestly, anything we could say about it would be entirely hypothetical and theoretical just because uh, it, it would kind of just be our own personal beliefs on it. You know, you have some people that skew more towards believing that all there is is free will and you have other people who, you know, believe that everything is entirely fate in some way. I think that somehow, some way, those two things uh, are both true. I can't tell you how. I can't tell you exactly how that works. Uh, to be honest, it's something I've never really put a lot of thought into. I've just kind of learned over and over in my life that if I do my part, if I do my job 
which is, uh, you know, basically using this work, using these rituals, using magic to bless whatever it is that I'm doing, um, then something positive and beneficial ends up growing from it. I can't tell you how much of that's fate, and I can't tell you how much of it's free will or anything else. Uh, but I think in some way they both work together. I think too. All right, and we're gonna end with one last question. Um, let's see, this one is going to be from Sean Nathan. Do you think magic will ever become more mainstream than it is now? And if so, how? Thanks, love you guys. Thank you. Um, I'm just going to, first of all, I want to introduce Baby to everybody. <laughs> if you haven't met her already, she's our little guardian angel. Um, I, I think it will. I think, I think actually right now, it's one of those things that came up with the question from um, the woman from Australia. I think this time, while it's been very hard for all of us, and difficult and it's brought about a lot of different ways of thinking, different ways of doing, different ways of living. It also has sort of brought about a new resurgence in an interest in magic and other ways uh, of, uh, you know, spiritual thinking and spiritual work. So I think that will, I think that will continue. Now what it will look like, who knows, mm -hmm. or, or what, you know, this path, what the path will look like or what, who knows, but do you think it will? I think, you know, it's hard to say. I, you know, in, if you look around at the world right now, there are probably more people who know about this stuff and are practicing this stuff than perhaps at any other time in the history of the world. Yeah. So in a lot of ways, we're already at as far as for saturation of these practices and, and some of this knowledge being made mainstream. I do think it will continue to make its way into the collective culture and collective psyche uh, of humanity, but we may not always call it magic. Right. You know, we'll develop other names for it. Like some of the concepts that we've been talking about in magic for the past, you know, several hundred years are the same things they're talking about now in the realm of quantum physics, but they don't call it magic. Right. They give it other names, but they, they've learned things, you know, for example, how just the, just the act of us observing light has an effect on whether it manifests in the physical world as, as particles or waves, like our ability, our, our observation of it, literally changes the structure of life. Yeah. So we're they're discovering how like our thoughts and, and our intelligence and intellect touching on this kind of all pervasive universal intellect, how these things do interact together to produce certain results. And I think they'll learn more and more about that as time goes on and learn more and more of how to do it, but I don't think they'll call it magic. I think there will be in the future, there will be an entire new language uh, and, and people will probably look at this stuff in an entirely different way. I don't think it will be considered supernatural or archaic anymore. Right. We'll learn more about how, you know, all of these things that people have talked about since the dawn of human civilization, like angels and demons and gods are all actually parts of ourselves, parts of our own souls and parts of our psyche. Uh, so we'll learn that all of these things are within us. They're not out there somewhere. Mm -hmm. um, and we'll learn more about how to use those things as well as more about how the nature of external reality is constructed and how we can change. It. But again, I don't necessarily think they'll call it magic. The word magic may completely die. It may disappear from our vocabulary and from human history. 
but people may continue to do the acts and the practices in different forms, even if the word magic becomes completely and absolutely forgotten. Well, and it's one more thing about that, and you, you're starting to see it in the mainstream, um, as far as even like in TV shows or film, um, take for instance, Legion, that show is amazing to watch. Um, and then, I mean, in something on a little bit more, you know, Dr. Strange. Oh, Dr. Strange. Yeah. Do, you know, so you, you see it, you'll, you'll see the techniques and you'll see aspects of magic showing up in mainstream movies mm -hmm. or books, things like that. So. I think that's a great way to end it. Uh, thank you guys so much, Damien, Lori, for being here with us. Thanks to all of our uh, audience members and for all the questions. Sorry we couldn't get to everyone. Uh, yeah, this was such a healing, uh, illuminating conversation. Uh, so, thank you. Well, thank you, Mark, and thank you, Buxu, for always supporting us. It's you guys are amazing. Please support their store because it's an amazing bookstore. And, and if you're in LA, actually go in and yeah, person. It's, it's a really great, great store. And we just want to say we love you all. Thank you so much for your support. Yeah, a lot and of y'all being here with us. Yep, y'all. Some of y'all have been with us for many years, and we truly appreciate your And welcome any new people to us. Yep, love having you too. Uh, thank you guys so much, everyone. If you haven't already, please click the green button to purchase a copy of this terrific uh, book and support our independent bookstore. If you'd like regular updates on our upcoming events, follow us on Crowdcast, subscribe to our newsletter. Otherwise, that's it for tonight. Thank you guys so much. Bye, everyone.